hand over to Gary now, who is talking about the wonderfully similar topic of step doing in synagogue and symbiosis, the Jews of Hellenistic Egypt. So thanks, Gary. Uh, thank you, Ian, as always. And thank you again, Naomi and everybody else at Mandelbaum, and the good to see friends and colleagues, and students, and everybody uh, in the room. Right, so a simple alliteration, Septuagint, Synagogue, and Symbiosis, the Jews of Hellenistic Egypt. So let's begin with where we were last week. So for those of you who were here last week, we dealt with the first Jews in Egypt, not the Exodus, that's a much older narrative, of course, but the first diasporic, diasporic community of Jews in Egypt uh, during the Persian period. And they got there uh, when the Babylonians were attacking uh, Jerusalem um, in the early 6th century BCE, many of the Jews fled in the other direction, to Egypt, uh, to escape the Babylonian army and what would become eventually the destruction of Jerusalem. And uh, Jeremiah 44.1 is our great passage because it gives us geography, because it's the names of places, all of which are in the delta, and then also the land of uh, Patros. And I showed you the map last time, and you can see most of the Jews wound up in the eastern delta. That would make sense, of course, because that's the land, the area that's closest to uh, their homeland, the land of Canaan. But for reasons that are unclear, some of them went south, and we saw the, uh, uh, the uh, descendants of that community amongst the Jews of Elephantini. Now, uh, a lot of this is general historical background to set the stage for where we're headed. Uh, the Babylonians fell to the Persians. I also showed this map last time. And this is the great Persian Empire, uh, the largest empire that the world had seen up until that point by far. Uh, homeland uh, Persia is uh, right here, today's southern Iran, but it stretched from Central Asia in the east all the way to the Mediterranean, various lands, including uh, Egypt. Uh, the, you can see all these um, um, places up here in the Aegean, including Marathon. The Greeks were the great enemy of the Persians throughout this period, and and fought a series of battles in the uh, 5th and 4th centuries, the most famous of them because of what? Because it has become an English word, marathon. And eventually, Alexander the Great, the great Greek or Macedonian uh, ruler, was able to conquer the Persians and establish the great empire of the Greeks under Alexander the Great. Essentially the same landmass as you see here. If you look at the two maps, they are basically the same landmass. Of course, in the Northwest, they are incorporating um, all of what is homeland Greece and inheriting this very la uh, large uh, Greek um, now empire. And that includes uh, Egypt, which will be our focus in just a moment. Alexander, or his uh, successors, uh, set up a number of Greek cities uh, in this realm. So that is to say, the culture of Greece was spread to what had been Egyptian or Semitic or Iranian-speaking uh, peoples. Many of them were known as Alexandria, including the most famous of them, the large seaport of Egypt that remains a large city in Egypt down to the present day. And we'll see that in just a moment. But uh, um, just to give you a sense, um, somewhere out here in what is today Afghanistan, and I only mention this because the city is in the news every once in a while, is the city of Kandahar second largest city in uh, Afghanistan after the capital of Kabul. Can you hear the word, the name Alexander in Kandahar, right? That actually was founded as another Alexandria more than 2,000 years ago during this time period. But over the course of centuries and millennia, the name was slightly altered into what is now pronounceable for the local Afghanis. In any case, that's just one sense of the great empire of Alexander. Now, he had a very short reign. He died young. He ruled for only about 13 uh, years. And when he died in 323 BCE, oh, there's a bust of the young Alexander. Um, well, he was always young, I guess, because he died young, but there's a bust of the young Alexander. Um, it's just what he looked like. This was done approximately 200 years later, and it's today in the British Museum. Uh, 
known as, in my field, the Third Temple. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, by the way, these uh, Greek kings, starting with Alexander, uh, um, fancied themselves to be the pharaohs. There were no real pharaohs left anymore. The old pharaohs of Egypt were a thing of the past after, Babel, after Persian rule and now Greek rule. Uh, you don't have native rule anymore in Egypt, but they still stylize themselves as pharaohs. The example I give is uh, Queen Victoria became Empress of India, you will recall, right? And of course the Queen is of uh, the United Kingdom is also officially the head of state in Australia and other realms. So Alexander becomes uh, the pharaoh, and there's his cartouche. And you all remember your hieroglyphics? I think I introduced them to you eight years ago when I spoke here, so I expect you to still remember them. And uh, if you didn't, if you've forgotten them, you read right to left in this case, and uh, you get the name Alexandros. Um, the cartouche of, of Alexander the Great. So, when he died, uh, his four generals, four of his generals, carved up the realm. He had no successor. So the successors were going to be these four generals, and they were unable, no single ruler could hold on to that kind of an empire. And so there's two of them up here in mainland Greece. By the way, today, of course, Greece is just on this side of the Aegean, and this is part of modern-day Turkey, but in antiquity, Greece is both sides of the Aegean. Okay, there are no Turks yet in that region. Um, they would arrive there in the Middle Ages. So this is all a Greek-speaking world. This is all classical Greece right here. So the, the Greek part of Greece, the homeland part of Alexander's empire, becomes two kingdoms. And then the rest of it, the huge land mass, was divided up between the Ptolemies here in the blue, ruling in Egypt, and the Seleucids, getting the most land, ruling from a homeland in between what is today Syria and uh, Iraq. And uh, that's the, the map as you see it. Now, if we, if we go closer, because we're going to be talking about these two kingdoms, you'll see that there is an overlap here between the blue and the gold, right there in the land of Israel. And that's because the two kingdoms, the Ptolemies and the Seleucids, uh, met in the land of Israel, and the border shifted over time. So this map is attempting to show you that at some time Israel was under Ptolemy rule, which it was for about 100 years, from almost exactly 300 uh, BCE to 200 BCE. And right around then, the Seleucids took over, and that takes us to another story which is not part of our story today. The early Seleucids were fine to the Jews. It was only Antiochus IV who persecuted the Jews when he had control of, the, of Jerusalem, as you see on this map, and that leads to the whole Maccabean revolt and the story of Hanukkah. That's a topic for another time. We're going to focus on the Ptolemy kingdom, which you uh, see right here. Now, these are the dates of the Ptolemy dynasty, founded by Ptolemy I, uh, again, one of Alexander's generals. And uh, there are 16, in that less than 300 year period, there are 16 different kings named Ptolemy. To further confuse matters, seven of their queens are named Cleopatra, the most famous being Cleopatra VII, the final one. <laughs> and four of their queens are named Berenike. Any, anyone named Bernice in the room? There's your uh, namesake, Berenike. How experts on the Ptolemy dynasty keep all these kings apart, I have no idea. And I think they fake it and have to look them up on Wikipedia just like I do. <laughs> because who can remember the difference between Ptolemy the Twelfth and Ptolemy the Thirteenth, after all, right? So that's the Ptolemy uh, dynasty, and that was the name that all the kings continued to use throughout. Now, the later Jewish historian Josephus, writing in the latter part of the first century C, the closing decades of the first century, explains all of Jewish history to the Greco-Roman world. At this point, the Romans are now the great power in the world, but the eastern half of the Mediterranean remained a Greek-speaking realm. The land of Israel, Egypt, all those countries. Uh, Latin didn't really find a home in those countries. It would for the Roman administration, the Roman military, but culturally it was Greek. Intellectually it was Greek. So Josephus writes in Greek. And he tells us in Antiquities Book 12, when he gets to tell the story of, of Ptolemy the First, he tells us, as you can see here, Ptolemy brought Jews from Judea and Jerusalem to Egypt. He had heard that the Jews had been loyal to Alexander, and he placed many of them to garrison. Now, through all these political upheavals, I want to point out, not the Babylonians, of course, but with everyone else, the Persians, 
Alexander, Ptolemies, the Jews were perfectly accepted in those various empires and kingdoms. And most likely, for just if I can put it on, on the most basic of terms, if you were a priest in the Jerusalem temple throughout this period, or somebody visiting the Jerusalem temple, Jewish, uh, you would not have known that there was any political changes. Because the Jews were allowed to continue to practice their traditional lifestyle, their traditional religious practices throughout this period, regardless of who was king. All of that changed, as I said a few moments ago, under Antiochus IV, uh, one of the early Seleucid kings. But basically, you have an ongoing Jewish life, culturally, religiously, in every which way. But you can see that a number of Jews were attracted to come to Egypt. Uh, they had been loyal to Alexander, as Josephus tells us. By the way, there were later rabbinic traditions about Alexander meeting the high priest in Jerusalem. We don't know if there's any historicity to them, but at least these are recorded legends in uh, rabbinic texts. And then Josephus says, and here's a long quote for you, at Alexandria, he, Ptolemy I, gave them equal privileges of citizens with the Macedonians themselves, that is to say the Greeks, but Alexander had been part of a Macedonian family, and required of them to take their oaths, they would keep their fidelity, etc., Nay, this is an old translation, nobody ever uses nay anymore. It's a great word, though, right? <laughs> nay, there were not a few other Jews who on their own accord went to Egypt, as invited by the goodness of the soil and by the liberality of Ptolemy. That's a great sentence from Josephus. <laughs> the Nile Valley is, of course, very fertile soil, especially the Nile Delta, some of the richest soil in the world. So this is the map of the Ptolemaic Empire with the Jewish communities noted in these various dots along the Nile, and as you can see up here, still with a large concentration of Jews in the surrounding around Jerusalem. But wherever you see a dot here, that means we have evidence of a Jewish community as far south, again, as we talked about last week, if you were here, uh, Elephantine. So we'll be looking at a few places. Here's Alexandria, the new city built on the western arm of the delta, western Nile uh, delta. And uh, we'll focus on Lanopopolis and a few other places. Uh, Schedia right there, we'll have a look at too. So, earliest evidence of Jews in uh, Ptolemaic Egypt, or Hellenistic Egypt, we'll call it that, uh, is a tomb that you're looking at right here in Alexandria. And the inscription on the tomb is just a man's name, and it's in Hebrew. Uh, Akavia, Ben, and then I guess something like Elionai or something. Interestingly, the person who wrote it just sort of ran out of room here and just had to put the last two letters, the Nun and the Yod over here, as I've indicated on the right. But it's all the same uh, one name. Somebody last week in the Q&A asked me about the use of Hebrew and how much Hebrew material do we have. And I was showing so much Aramaic material. They have shown you all sorts of Greek material. And the answer is very little. And this is about what we get. We get occasional tomb markers for the names in Hebrew. But as I'll show you soon, this is it. You're not going to see any more Hebrew today. Everything else we want to look at is in Greek. So you're looking at a population in, uh, such as these, you're looking at a population in Egypt where the local Egyptians continue to speak their old Egyptian language. The old language that's recorded in the hieroglyphics was still spoken by the local Egyptian population. But the educated elite, the ruling class, and all those people spoke Greek, and everything else was in Greek. The academy, the economy, uh, international trade, all that was in Greek. So if you wanted to participate in that higher uh, cultural level, you did everything in Greek, and the Jews were part of that world. And that's the main takeaway point from what I'm presenting uh, this afternoon. So we have Jewish tomb inscriptions from a place called Leontopolis. And I'll come back to that in just uh, a few moments. I showed it to you briefly where it was on the map. And the only reason we know that these people are necessarily Jews is because their names are Jewish. It's all Greek. There's no artwork here. You don't see a menorah or anything like that. And the one on the left is a person named Jesus, right? That's eventually the name of Jesus, but in this case, it's just a Greek form of Joshua. And uh, one on the, on the right is just somebody named Abramos, right? That's just a Greek form of Abram or Abraham. So these are clearly Jewish tombstones. Nobody outside of the Jewish community would have been using these names at, at this time period. <coughs> Not for centuries would any of these names be anything but Jews. Now, the Jews were so integrated into that world, and I just talked about the intellectual uh, background of that world, that they felt the need to translate the Bible into Greek. We take it for granted today, because we read the Bible 
those of us who can read it in Hebrew, fine, but we still have English translations next to us, typically, and in our homes. And uh, Jews and Christians in the English-speaking world can discuss the Bible together in English, and uh, Jews translated the Bible into all sorts of languages, and then eventually Christians into all sorts of languages. Where did it start? Right here. This is the first translation of the Bible into another language. And in fact, it may be the first translation of any sacred text in any religious tradition into another language. So that's something, for, that's something quite remarkable here. It began with the translation of the Torah, uh, the foundational Jewish text, the first part of the Bible, during the reign of Ptolemy II. And uh, it's in the middle of the fifth century BCE. The prophets and the writing sections of the Jewish Bible would uh, take more decades, if not a century, to get uh, translated. And what was the impetus for the translation? Well, the Jews of Egypt did not have a wide knowledge of Hebrew, and so they felt the need to translate it into Greek. But it may also have come, there's different evidence in both directions, it may also have been a, an edict of Ptolemy II himself, because Ptolemy had constructed the great library of Alexandria, and in that library were to be held uh, all of the texts that existed in the kingdom. And so that the Great Library could house them all, right? It's the equivalent of the National Library of Australia or the Library of Congress in the United States or the British Library in London. That's what the Great Library of Alexandria was all about. So if the Jews had a Bible in Hebrew or Torah in Hebrew, we need a Greek translation of it for the Great Library. So it may have been both factors. They're not mutually exclusive, that the ruling class of Egypt wanted to have a Greek translation of the Bible, of the Torah, and that the Jews felt the need for it because you now have generations of Jews living in diaspora whose Hebrew would have been less and less over the course of generations. Only the very educated would have known Hebrew. And so this is a 19th century image of what the Great Library uh, looked like. And you can see various people putting scrolls. Everything would have been done in Egypt on papyrus scrolls, even though the world, even though parchment had now been developed in elsewhere in the Near East, you still had Egypt, of course, using papyrus because of the papyrus reeds that grow on the banks of the Nile. And you can see that somebody's giving you, you know, some sort of you notes know, half Greek, half Egyptian kind of architecture in the symbiosis of Greek and Egyptian culture here uh, in the Great Library of Alexandria. And so the Jews translate the Bible um, into uh, into Greek. Now we'll go back to this for just for a moment. Uh, so the Jewish legend is that 70 translators, either 72 translators, six from each tribe, or other manuscripts read 70 translators, uh, from Jerusalem, where they knew Hebrew very well, of course, came to Egypt, and they, were, and they translated the Bible into Greek. And the legend goes that they were put into separate cubicles, and that all 70 of them came up with the same translation. A miracle. One of my colleagues at the Hebrew University, Isaiah Gottlieb, likes to quit. It would have been a greater miracle if the 70 Jews were in the same room and came up with the same translation. <laughs> so that's the legend. Uh, what was the need for such a legend? Oh, good question. Actually, the first time that legend is reported is actually in, by a Christian scribe, 2nd century CE. Yeah. Uh, the, need, the need for that legend is to demonstrate that this is also a sacred text. Right? That there's a divine hand in the creation of the Greek Bible. That's a very important point to make. Thank you very much for that. Right? That just like the Hebrew text is sacred uh, and is seen as the word of God, when the Jews who created the Septuagint, it's also the word of God. And that's what that legend demonstrates for us. Septuagint is, means the 70. You can, your basic Greek. Septuagint in Greek, which is a Greek prefix there for the word seven. This is the 70, um, and um, um, so you get uh, the um, name Septuagint being the, the translation of the 70 spells. You can also call it the Old Greek translation, if you will. Okay. Now, earliest documentation for it. We actually have documentation. These are tiny fragments of the Book of Deuteronomy that were found in Egypt, 1917, more than 100 years ago now, second century BCE, and they're now housed in the John Wyland Library in Manchester. So within, these are within 100 years, let's say, of the actual translation. 
So very tiny fragments, this is all we have, but this is the earliest evidence for it. I always like to take a moment and remind ourselves what these libraries are and where they are and how wonderful they are. Has anybody been to the John Ryland Library in Manchester? Okay, Lucy. I mean, you know what it looks like. This is it. It is the cathedral to learning. Right? Look at the architecture. Okay, on the outside, it just looks like some plain Victorian building. But when you go inside, it looks like a real cathedral. And John Rylands was a wealthy industrialist in Manchester, a bibliophile. And when he passed away, his wife built this as a memorial to him to house his library. It's now one of the great libraries in the world, not only for books, but for manuscripts in our, in our field and in other fields as well. Question, Tom? No, so we can see. Oh, sorry. Right, right, right. right. Yeah. And, I, and I have a fondness for it. Looks like the great synagogue of Sydney, right? I have a um, great fondness for it because my mother lived in Manchester for her youth from the ages of 16 through 24. So, uh, and I still have uh, family in Manchester. So, next time you're there. Okay. Um, we also have fragments from uh, the same time period which are in Cairo. This is, uh, there are 117 fragments of the same manuscript. They're all very tiny portions of Genesis and Deuteronomy. Like it's called uh, Papyrus Fuad number 266. See the papyrus reads, by the way, you can see this quick crossing of the papyrus here, hopefully. And here are more fragments of it. And what's most interesting is that while the text is in Greek, uh, whenever the word Lord is to be written, the scribe wrote it in Hebrew. So he's writing left to right in Greek, and he gets here, and he leaves a blank, and then writes it in right to left. And so you can read the Hebrew, that's yod hey vav hey, also here, also here, and here's a close-up of one of them. Now it's in a relatively cursive Aramaic-style script, the kind we saw last time at the Elephantini. They probably didn't read it aloud. In fact, in the Septuagint, in the Greek tradition, when you get to this word, you're supposed to say kurios, the Greek word for Lord, just like Jews will say Adonai, or an English translation of Lord. But there's the, there's the evidence um, for this. Was it um, in the entire Benita that they were discovered? Uh, this is all a thousand years before that, right? Okay. These are, there are no, I don't think there are any fragments of Septuagint in the Cairo and Judea. Cairo and Giza? Yeah, no, there, that's all much later, yeah. all medieval. By that point, the Jews were not reading the Greek Septuagint anymore, as I'll talk about in a moment. No, even though it's the same country. Uh, so fascinating that they would write the word in, in Hebrew letters. And some more examples of that. So, another fragment, first century BCE, of the book of Job, the end of the book of Job, chapter 42, of Papyrus Oxyrhynchus. Try to say that, Oxyrhynchus, okay? <laughs> well, it's another place in Egypt. It was on the map before, and we'll show you a little bit more of it. This is in the Sackler Library in Oxford. And the same thing, the divine name written in Hebrew letters right here. Okay. Now, uh, let's take an excursion to talk about the Oxyrhynchus Papyri collection. Uh, a half a million, you're, you're going to take a breath when I say that, a half a million fragments in Greek, mainly all in Greek, were found in a rubbish heap in Oxyrhynchus, Egypt in 1896 by Grenfell and Hunt. Half a million. Okay. Uh, here they are. They were graduate students in Oxford, and they went off and found a. They were told to go to Egypt and see what you can find. And they dug in the. It's not dirt. They dug in the sand, and there they found half a million uh, papyri fragments. So those of you who are undergraduates or certainly graduate students who are aspiring to doctoral doctoral work and so on, um, have people to emulate. Go to Egypt and find another. A quarter of a million will do. We'll give you your PhD. Okay, but here you got a half a million. How long does it take to catalog, study, read, publish half a million fragments of Greek uh, papyri? And the answer is it's still going on today. There's a worldwide effort to do all this. It's still happening today. These fragments are mainly in Oxford, but they've been distributed through other parts of the world, uh, other places uh, in, 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 the, in the UK, Europe, and US even. Uh, but there's there, there's Grenfell and Hunter. This is when they were still doctoral students. I, I, I have no doubt that 
I don't know, 20, 25 years later, they must have shown up at Downton Abbey and were seated next to the Dowager Countess one night for dinner because they looked exactly the kind of people who showed up there. Okay. Uh, and another uh, Septuagint text from the Oxyrhynchus collection. Those are the two. Right? The first one I showed you, a fragment of Job, and this one, various fragments of the Book of Psalms. Notice it was only published in 2011. They're still, as I said, doing this work. Okay. Uh, so half a million papyri fragments, two situations, unless we still find another one. Okay. So two, they're showing you that there were Jews in the community, and this is what happens to these papyri. Uh, and I had, um, I, I spent a considerable amount of time in, in Oxford, usually reading Hebrew manuscripts, but last summer, I decided, okay, it's finally time to go see these Oxyrhynchus papyri. So I made an appointment at the Sackler Library in Oxford where they're kept. And uh, so happened I overlapped in Oxford last summer with one of our uh, PhD students in classics, uh, Emmanuel Akralakis, and the two of us went off to look at these documents uh, together. And you can see the very ones that I just showed you are here uh, in these plates under glass. And uh, there we were having the time of our lives, as you can imagine. And uh, I sort of turn them for you so you can actually see that these are the same uh, documents that I just showed you in, the, in these images. So these a marvelous uh, experience of reading those uh, texts and holding them in your hand. And um, little by little, they're all going online, so you can actually uh, search for this if you want to actually find these you know, images. OK. Remarkably, we understand why the Jews of Egypt had the Bible in Greek, right? Because they needed to read the Bible, and that was the language that they could read it. Okay? But remarkably, the Septuagint written in Egypt was brought back to the land of Israel because we have fragments of the Septuagint found in two places along the Dead Sea from this time period. From Qumran, where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, and from a place to the south, Nahal Hever, near uh, En Gedi. So, here they, here they are, from Cave 4 of Qumran, Septuagint fragments in Greek of the Book of Deuteronomy. These people read Hebrew. They had 20 copies, 25 copies of the Book of Deuteronomy at Qumran. But they somehow had the Greek version there as well. Just doing some reading of it, no doubt. Um, now in the Israel Museum. And uh, this one also from Cave 4, a fragment of the Book of Leviticus. And from about a century or so later, 50 CE, or maybe a little bit after that, we have uh, Septuagint fragments of a scroll of the Minor Prophets, a considerable chunk of the Minor Prophets scroll uh, in Greek. And again, uh, the same thing, by the way, uh, the divine name written in Hebrew characters, again, in this case. And there's actually one right here. It's broken off. You can just see the, the yod and the hay. And if you can read Greek in both of these cases, you see the way Thales right after God, and also to the right of that one over there. So what you have here is Lord God, which they probably read as Kyrios Theos, the Lord God, translating Hebrew, Adonai, Elohim, something like that. So fascinating uh, that the people in the land of Israel also had copies of the Septuagint. Um, we're going to leave the Septuagint for a moment, but not before reminding us that this became the Bible of Christianity, the Old Testament of Christianity. Uh, by and large, Jews stopped reading the Septuagint Sometime in the early Middle Ages, we still may have some documentation of it beyond those years, but it becomes the Bible of Christianity, and this is the uh, magnificent Codex Sinaiticus, a complete full codex, 4th century CE, written on beautiful parchment, uh, called Sinaiticus because it was kept, preserved at the Greek Orthodox Monastery at St. Catherine's in Sinai for more than a millennium until uh, in the 19th century it made its way to Europe uh, and, and now housed uh, in the British Library. There are some leaves actually in Leipzig, Germany and St. Petersburg, Russia, but uh, the vast majority of it is in uh, the British Library where you're always welcome to go in and you can on a public display there in one of the uh, exhibition rooms. Yes, please. So the Jews had a different version. How comparable are the two? Uh, that's a whole other question, but the answer is essentially the same. For all intents and purposes, the Jewish translation of the Bible, the Jewish Bible into Greek, becomes the Old Testament of the early church, Greek-speaking church, with almost no difference. But how do you know that the Septuagint was 
what I'm saying is when the Jews had their own version oh. of this say, ah. because there's, I don't, I don't know anything about this. Well, the world's expert is Ian Young, so you can speak to him afterwards. <laughs> okay. On um, whether the Greek text matches up against the Jewish traditional text yes. is what you're asking. In, in, in most cases, yes. In many many books, yes. But in certain cases, like the book of Jeremiah, it's radically different. Yeah. That's a whole other issue. Yeah. Okay. Now, to two issues, right? The other thing about Hellenistic Egypt is that this is where the synagogue developed. How many of you knew that, right? Today, you take it for granted. You go to the synagogue. Which is a Greek word. Right? Meaning where the people come together or the church, or the mosque, or wherever religious tradition you have, and you gather together for prayer. May I remind you that in the ancient world, religion was in temples, as it still is, for example, in the Hindu tradition, right? And in other religious traditions, you, you, religion is in the hand of priests, and you go to the temple, and the laity, if I can use that word, doesn't participate necessarily in the daily religious life in the same way. Right? The worship of God is in the hands of the select uh, religious class, the priesthood. So the Jews living in Egypt were beyond, too far from Jerusalem to participate in the one temple in Jerusalem, and so we have the development of something called the synagogue. And it's the first time we see that. So if you go to synagogue or church or mosque today, this is actually where it all starts. Now the term is not synagogue yet, the term is prosuche, the Greek word for prayer, for prayer house. So it tells us what they were doing there. A whole new mode of worship was developing in the diaspora community by the Jews of Egypt, where they would gather and congregationally pray. What most of us today take for granted was not always the case. This is where it begins. And this is the first example of it. And uh, it's, dated, it's dated around 240 BC in Tchedia, suburb of Alexandria. We have about eight or ten dedicatory stone inscriptions like the one I'm showing you here, all written in Greek, which are the dedications of prosuche and later synagogues. Almost all of them in the name of the king and the queen, as you see here, Ptolemy and Berenike. And none of them, however, we do not have the architectural remains to know what these buildings look like. All of these stone inscriptions were found in secondary use, which is an archaeological term for when a building was destroyed or no longer needed or whatever. You didn't always have to go to the quarry and start new stones. You'd take stones from wherever you were, whatever was nearby, and build, them, build another wall or another building with it. And all of the dedicatory inscriptions I'm going to show you are in secondary use. So we don't know what the place might have looked like, how large the place was, but at least we have a layout floor plan, but at least we have these dedicatory inscriptions, and we're very happy we have those. So I'm just going to go through these quickly uh, from a whole series. Uh, yes, there's a town in Egypt called Crocodilopolis, which of course probably could be a town in Australia as well, right? <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, And you can see these dedicatory inscriptions. Some of them, good photos are not always available of these things. Some of them I have to scan from uh, books. Um, another one, whichever Ptolemy this is, and his wife Cleopatra. And sometimes we get the names of who's presiding, right? So these are the Jews who were presiding, Theodore and Achilleo. Any, any comments about their names? Great. Can't get more Greek than Theodore, which means gift of God. Uh, and Achilleo, a version of Achilles. Okay, so the Jews had these Greek names. We'll come back to that. So, more dedicatory inscriptions. And... Um, few more, still using the word prosuche in Alexandria, and um, one more here. By this point, 40 BCE, the Romans have arrived. The Romans are on the doorstep, and the Romans have arrived. And so there's the two extra lines here at the bottom in Latin. Does everybody see that? Okay. The last two lines are in Latin. Uh, Regina et Rex, we search. The queen and the king have ordered this. Okay. So you could just I guess you could probably build a synagogue or a prosuke by yourself, but uh, they are always mentioning the king and queen. And finally, 3 CE, we get the term synagogue. Uh, in this inscription, it actually doesn't use the word synagogue per se, but this term archi synagogos, which means head of the synagogue. 
right? You know the ARCH, like uh, Archangel, right? The, the Chief Angel and so on, Archbishop, right? So the Archisynagogus would be the head of the synagogue. And here that name must have sort of, the name of this institution must have at this point switched over from uh, uh, from Prosperche uh, to this. Now, remarkably, just like the Septuagint was brought from Egypt into the land of Israel, so was the synagogue. This is the famous Theodotus inscription, now in the Israel Museum, found in Jerusalem in the early part of the 20th century, and it is an inscription in Greek referring to the dedication of a synagogue in Jerusalem. The temple was still standing when this was in place. So they didn't really need the synagogue for prayer because they could just go to the temple to do religious worship, but the institution was imported back from the diaspora community into the homeland community in Jerusalem. And here's a translation of it, Theodotus, who happened to be a priest of Kohen, and the head of the synagogue, as was his father and his grandfather, built this synagogue for the reading of the Torah, observance of the commandments, as an inn or a guest house for wayfarers, presumably when pilgrims came to Jerusalem for the pilgrimage festivals. So it's a remarkable testimony to how the Greek-speaking Jewish world in Egypt has now influenced the homeland community in Israel. But other Jews said, okay, we still need a temple in Egypt. So there was a Jewish temple in Egypt. Beyond the El Fatini Temple, which we talked about last time, which was destroyed in 409 BCE, a second Jewish temple was constructed outside of Jerusalem, in Egypt. Onias IV had been the high priest in Jerusalem, but he was uh, deposed by Jewish Hellenizers who wanted to cooperate more with the Seleucids, and he actually witnessed the desecration of the temple under Antiochus IV and fled to Egypt. And there he received permission from Ptolemy VI to build a Jewish temple with animal sacrifices in that very city of Leontopolis, which is now called, from this point on, the land of Onias. And we know about this from Josephus and actually the Mishnah and the Babylonian Talmud described this temple as well. So it was known to Jews uh, beyond this little community in Egypt, or sizable community in Egypt. So if there's references to a Jewish temple in Egypt, uh, let's go excavate. And Sir Flinders Petrie, the great archaeologist uh, who had a very long life, uh, English, British archaeologist, decided to go excavate uh, the temple, to go find it. And he believes he found it. And he published it in this book, uh, 1906. So here's the map, the delta. And you can see I've marked this place. Uh, you probably can't read this unless you're real close. It is also called Tel el Yehudiyeh. That is to say, if you went there today and, let, and asked the local Arabic-speaking population of Egyptians, what's the name of this place? Leontopolis is the Greek name. The Greeks called it that because the old Egyptian goddess Sechmet, who was a lioness, was worshipped there. So when the Greeks arrived, they called it the city of the lion, Leontopolis. Well, eventually the Greek-speaking part of Egypt is no longer, and it becomes a totally Arabic-speaking environment. And the Arabs called it, the Egyptian-speaking Arabs called it, Arabic-speaking Egyptians, rather, called it Tel Aviv the place of the Jews. The Jewish population of this site was so great that that's the way it was still referred to today on maps of Egypt. And it's today on the outer suburbs, northern suburbs of Cairo, not far from the airport. Okay, next time you're in next time you're cut. Okay. Um, this is Petrie's drawing of what it looked like. Here's a more modern version. And you can see there are remnants of the old pharaohs going back to the New Kingdom. Uh, Merneptah and Ramses III, but up there in the corner is where Petrie said he found the Onias Temple. Uh, these are images from his publication. Truth be told, there's not a lot there that demonstrates that this was a Jewish temple, that this is the place. But Petrie's shadow and his influence was so great that we're willing to give him the benefit of the doubt because nobody knew the archaeology of Egypt and Israel and other lands better than the great Sir Flinders Petrie. Uh, this document down here is the only real evidence of Jews. It's an ostracon written in what's called a Demotic Egyptian writing. 
and it mentions somebody named Abram. So clearly he was Jewish. Uh, it's a builder's account, so he must have been the contractor or somebody who was building the temple, and there's a small document that records that right here. And that was sufficient for Petrie to say, I have found the temple of Onias. So we'll give him the benefit of the doubt and say he has found it. Uh, just like the Jewish temple in, in Jerusalem was destroyed in 70, this temple was also destroyed in 73 uh, as a punishment to the Jews. It was not that the Jews of Egypt rebelled, that was the Jews of Israel who rebelled against the Romans in the Great Revolt, but either Titus or Vespasian uh, destroyed this temple as well. And there it lay in ruins until Petri arrived 1900 years later, uh, 1800 plus years later, to go find it. Uh, by the way, Petrie is one of the few archaeologists in the world that has a museum named for him. Uh, University College London campus in Bloomsbury. And inside you have all sorts of display cases of everything that he brought back from Egypt. This was in the years before uh, real antiquities laws. And uh, many of these things come from uh, the Onias Temple in the city of, of Levitopolis, Tel Aviv. Uh, personal note. Uh, my teacher, Cyrus Gordon, on the left, that's his memoir, um, worked with Petrie. They excavated together at a place called Tel al Jewel near Gaza uh, for four seasons. Uh, and Gordon, uh, was a graduate student, Gordon used to love to tell stories about uh, Sir Flinders Petrie, uh, who was one of his teachers. And so I consider him one of my grand teachers. And uh, in, that, in Ian's case, he would be a great grand teacher. Uh, uh, since Ian studied with one of Cyrus Gordon's um, uh, teachers, uh, students rather. So uh, there's the great Sir Flinders. He was a lover of the Jewish people, by the way, and he asked to be buried in the Protestant cemetery of Mount Zion in Jerusalem. That's his simple tomb. So uh, this is right outside the old city walls near the uh, Zion Gate. And if you can see it, it says simply Flinders Petrie. And instead of a Christian cross, can everybody see what's on the top? And on the side, okay, because of his love of Egypt, okay. But he remained a devout Christian, and as I said, wanted to be buried in Jerusalem in the Protestant cemetery, and there it is. And of course, there's always an Australian connection, because earlier today, Ian reminded me that Sir Flinders Petrie is the grandson of your great explorer, Matthew Flinders, okay, uh -huh. uh, through his mother, Anne Flinders. And so there's the Australian connection. If you want to know how to connect Sydney to Jerusalem, here you go. <laughs> And again, his tomb. Okay. Now, um, all sorts of other things that he found, or his uh, team found, in Onias. Another Jewish tombstone. Notice the place is called the land of Onias. Right? There's nothing in this tomb inscription that would tell you this person was Jewish. Her name is Greek. Her parents' names are Greek. And it just happens to be that she died when she was 20. Uh, and this tomb inscription and it's a very interesting inscription because it's a conversation between the tombstone and the deceased. Very creative. And in fact, notice she tells us that she went to the house of Hades, right? She's using Greek imagery, even though clearly she's Jewish because a non-Jew never would have called that city the land of Onias, only she calls it uh, the land of Onias. In fact, she says in the next to last line here, in the first half, she went down to the shadowy region of Lethe. That's one of the rivers of Hades, okay, in the underworld. So it's fascinating that the Jews were sort of bought into this Greek culture and started using these Greek metaphors. Okay, and then the symbiosis. Uh, Septuagint we did, synagogue we've done, and the Onias Temple. Jews were involved in every part of Egyptian cultural life. Let's look at it. We start with Ezekiel the tragedian. Not to be confused with Ezekiel, the prophet in the Bible. He wrote a book, a play, in the 2nd century BCE called the Exodus. You can't travel in the Mediterranean without seeing Greek theaters, right? You see them wherever you go, okay? You see the Greek theaters in any of the remains at Pompeii, at Roman, of course, but throughout Greece, throughout the Eastern Mediterranean, um, beautiful one in Amman, Jordan, in Jerash, in Jordan, in Beit Sha'an, in, in Israel. I mean, they're just, Caesarea, of course, they're just everywhere. So people are putting on plays. That's part of Greek culture. And what are they doing? Well, they're putting on the great triumvirate of, of Aeschylus and Sophocles and Euripides, right? And other lesser known Greek playwrights. I mean, that's the, that's the active playwright on the stage, centuries after those great um, uh, Athenian playwrights wrote. 
But finally, the Jews said, you know, I can write a play, but I'm not going to write a play about um, Greek heroes. I'm going to take the great Jewish story and write a play. He writes a play about the Exodus. There's no greater Jewish story than the Exodus. Here we are, just a few weeks away from Passover, right? So he says, I will create a play. And he writes a play, Greek-style drama in five acts. We only have 269 lines extant. It's written in the Greek meter that's associated with Euripides. And it even has a monologue by Moses. Right? You can't have a Greek play without the hero having given him a monologue. He puts that in there. It's going to look like a Greek play. Um, and even the famous Greek uh, dr dramatic technique of the messenger coming in off, from off stage to report about the battle. Okay? That goes on in all the Greek drama. Why did a messenger have to report about the battle? Because they couldn't stage the battle on the stage. Right? Today, you can do anything. You know, pyrotechnics and you know, Disney staging and so on. Right? But in those years, they had to rely on a messenger who would come in and report what happened on the battlefield. Well, Ezekiel does that as well. So, and that's somebody comes in and reports about the drowning of the Egyptians in the Sea of Greece. Fantastic play. Uh, I always say this to my students in the U.S., and you'll understand the reference, of course, as well. And I mean this very seriously, although it gets a laugh. If Fiddler on the Roof helps you, that's a great parallel, right? You take the quintessential American theatrical musical, and you narrate the quintessential Jewish story, Fiddler on the Roof. Of course, the quintessential Jewish American musical is also Jewish, but um, you know, from Rodgers and Hammerstein and everybody else, but you, you tell the tale the Jewish tale instead of Oklahoma or whatever is part of the standard Broadway tale. Okay. So that's what this is like. Think about that. Um, and unfortunately, we only know of his work as cited by later Christian church authors. And together, we can piece together 269 lines. Um, until 2010, because amongst the Antirinkus papyri, Dirk Obing of Oxford found another fragment. So we now have 280 lines or something like that. Okay? Is that great? And he identified the fragment, and it's actually, this is a translation of it, and it's the part of the play where Miriam is involved with the finding of the baby Moses' portion. Okay? Must have been near the beginning of the play. Right? Okay. Fantastic stuff. Um, Philo the poet, now you can use the Philo the philosopher wrote a poem called Jerusalem. We only have 29 lines of this. It is exactly in the hexameter of Homer's Iliad and Odyssey. Except he said, oh, he read Homer. I'm going to tell a poem, I'm going to write an epic poem. I'm not going to talk about the great Greek history and the story of Troy, uh, of the Iliad. I'll tell the story about my city, Jerusalem. Now I live in Egypt, but I know my ancestral city is Jerusalem. And he tells the story, we only have 29 lines, but he writes a poem called Jerusalem. Philo the philosopher, of course, totally at home with Greek philosophy, especially Plato, but also others, the Stoics and so on. And he was able to write voluminous works in Greek, all of which are, almost all of which are extant today, because they were preserved especially by the Christian church. Jews, this is just a schematic without showing you the documents. We have references to Jews who were wool merchants, vine dressers, farmers, potters, weavers, flute players, donkey drivers. Right? They were engaged in every part of the society, every part of the economy, the commerce, the trade, the farming, and so on. Sometimes we know they're Jewish because of their names. This is a man named Samuel. This is a man named uh, Jacob, whose father was also named Jacob. Usually, they don't have Jewish names but they're called the Jew somewhere in the text. So that gives us a sense of that. Um, this is one of my, this is, I think, my favorite. Uh, this is a third century BCE papyrus now in Cairo, and it's an account of the delivery of bricks. Right? They were always building things. You always had to have bricks delivered for the next construction project and so on. And it gives you the day-by-day -day accounting. And on the seventh day, it says, Sabbath, the Sabbath, and there's no delivery of bricks. There's no Jewish names here, it's just an account ledger, right? But it clearly was a Jewish brick business or something like that, because they wouldn't deliver bricks on the seventh day of the Sabbath. Fantastic. 
I was hoping for a little more shock and awe from you. <laughs> <laughs> Jews are in the army. Just like the Jews of Elephantini, as we saw last week, were part of the Persian army, you now have Jews in Egypt serving in the uh, army of the Ptolemy kings. Uh, this is a papyrus in Trinity College, Dublin. Uh, this one's in Berkeley. Um, and both men involved in this transaction are called Jews of the Epigone, that's the elite reserves, something like the National Guard, or call it the US, whatever you, what's Australian? Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, and more Jews serving in the army of the Ptolemies. This is another papyrus in Berkeley. And in fact, uh, the first one, notice Theodorus, which Greek name, son of Theodorus, also called Samuel, therefore we know he's Jewish. The second one, Greek name, Greek father's name, Nicanor and Jason, um, but both are called Jews of the first Hipparchy. Sorry, What is the Hipparchy? That's the elite horse uh, cavalry, right? Hippos, Greek, for horse, right? That's the elite horse cavalry. And there were two Jews, and they're mentioned in this text. Right? These are just, I'm putting together random, not random, I'm collating for you all the little references that we can create a narrative out of a vast amount of evidence. The vast majority of which, of course, is not Jewish, it has no Jewish connection. But we can here and there see the Jews, the flute player, the wool, the wool maker, the soldier, and so on. It's all Greek. Everything here is in Greek. Everything's in Greek. Uh, here's a stone inscription from a place. Um, uh, uh, I, I should say and a well in Fayum or something like that. But Fayum is a region of Egypt, west of the Nile, and it's a Greek. It's in Greek. It's a dedicatory inscription, and it is dedicated by a man named Elazar. Therefore, he's clearly Jewish, and he dedicates the sundial and the well for the city. Right? Every city needs a sundial. Every city needs a community well. And in this case, it was a Jew named Elazar who donated uh, the wealth, and there is the and the sundial, and there's his uh, dedicatory inscription. Uh, Alexandria, we're going to end uh, with this, was so Jewish. I've shown you little bits and pieces elsewhere. Uh, because Alexandria is still a city today, the amount of documentation of Alexandria is much less. Right? You can't go excavate, ask a couple million people to move while we excavate your city. So most of our documentation comes from other smaller towns which are in ruins and we can excavate them. Alexandria is still a bustling city today. And uh, this is a recreation of what ancient Alexandria looked like. By the way, notice the grid. Right? This is the Greek polis, right? If you've ever gone into a Middle Eastern city uh, in, the, in, in, in the Khan of Cairo or the, uh, the old city of Jerusalem or the Souk in Amman, it's chaos. Right? You, you can't find your way in or out, even natives, right, Rick? Okay. I mean, it's just a warren of alleyways. A Greek polis is beautiful, isn't it? And a grid, and a boulevard's running this way, and running that way. Okay. Boy, those, those, those Greeks were once. Okay. So that's ancient Alexandria. There are two Jewish neighborhoods that have been reconstructed based on the evidence that we have, one, the Jewish quarter in the west, and the Jewish quarter up there in the east. And it's been suggested that the population of Alexandria Estimate might have been about a fourth Jewish, like a modern, like an ancient version of New York City today. I'm just unremarkable how present Jews were in that community. The Coda. Um, Jews continued to live in Egypt in large numbers throughout this period. Uh, eventually, the community, the largest community, shifted from Alexandria to Cairo. Cairo was a newly founded city in the ninth century during the Muslim period. Uh, and that's where the Jews started moving to more and more in service to various uh, caliphs and sultans, the Fatimid dynasty in particular. And that's where Maimonides lived. He was the rabbi of that community, having emigrated there from Spain uh, in the 12th century. And somebody asked about the Cairo Geniza. And uh, of course, this brings us to an entire topic well beyond our purview today. But we have Cairo Geniza documents all found in Cairo, in the Ben Ezra synagogue in Fustat, Old Cairo. And this is one that's in the Smithsonian, and it's actually a letter sent from somebody in Alexandria to Cairo. And for those of you who can read Hebrew, you can see what it says here. The letter's in Arabic, but it says, Min Iskandarit, okay, from Alexandria. Iskandarit is how you say Alexandria in Arabic. 
Uh, so it's being sent from there to Cairo and wound up. Just as a reminder, the Jews continued to live in Alexandria throughout deep into the Middle Ages, and in fact, into the 20th century as well. And my coda of codas is the book uh, Out of Egypt by Andre Asimov, who grew up uh, in Alexandria, a Jewish family in Alexandria. And the Jews lived there until 1956 when they uh, started leaving en masse uh, because of the fervor stirred up by um, uh, President Abdel, Kamal Abdel Nasser. And um, uh, Asimov came to the US, became a professor of comparative literature, Princeton University, and wrote a beautiful memoir. Has anybody read out of Egypt his memoir? It's just a beautiful story about what it was like to grow up in a Jewish family in Alexandria. And when they left in 1956, they left on the eve of Passover. And he, um, of course, ends his book by telling us they were not a religious family. They came from a rather, rather secular family. Uh, the language at home was more French than anything else than Arabic. And a very well-educated French-speaking Jewish family, which was not uncommon in, in Egypt in those years. And uh, they decided to go for a walk along the uh, Mediterranean in Alexandria. And he ends by saying, and the people who passed us would never ever know nor even guess that this was our last night in Alexandria. It is a Rendsburg family tradition to read this last paragraph of this book every year at our family seder. Okay? Uh, as the Jews left Egypt, uh, it's a great coda to something that has jumped ahead 2,000 years, but I thought I would at least mention uh, the book by Andre Asimov. Thank you so much.